Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back. I hope you uh, enjoyed your morning sessions and I'd like to welcome you to our panel discussion on the future of work um, till about one o'clock. Um, my name's Claire Ward. I'm a National Executive Member up in the North West and I'm Chair of the Equal Ops Committee. And here we've got with us today, Matt Cray. Um, Matt is um, uh, the Employment Right Policy Officer for the TUC. And we've also got Jeevan Sander, who's an economist at King's College London. Um, but we're going to start, first of all, with Matt today. As I said, he's the Employment Right Policy Officer for the TUC. He covers labour market enforcement and family friendly rights. Before this, Matt Project managed the TUC Union Modernisation Fund project on precarious employment. And at the moment, he leads research to better understand the challenges young working parents face. He also previously worked in learning and skills arm of the TUC, Union Learn, helping unions negotiate good quality apprenticeships with employers. And Matt completed an LLM in labour law from King's College London in 2015. So welcome, Matt, uh, and over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me along. Um, I was asked just to uh, give some views on what we think the future of work um, might look like. Um, so I'll just try and share a skip screen if that's OK. So what do we think the um, future of work will look like? Well, I think it might go sort of one of two ways. So will we see um, working conditions being eroded? or hopefully um, with, with uh, trade union campaigning and interventions, will we see um, decent work for all? Um, and I think obviously there are two important factors in how the future of work will be shaped. Um, first key factor is what sort of government are we going to have in the future? What, what sort of government we've got now? What, what are their commitments? So unfortunately, I think at the moment, we've got a government which is um, sort of focused on deregulating labor market regulation. So your employment rights, um, and let, letting the markets determine what sort of standards workers should get. But hopefully in the future, we might see a government which is committed to properly funding public services in the education sector, um, a government which recognises the importance of unions, so it gives unions more rights to represent their workers and, in, and uh, increases and improves the employment right for workers. So that's one key factor. And I think the second key factor is how prepared um, is the union movement going to be to bring about decent work for all. So I think we've got a strong trade union movement that is really campaigning for um, important employment rights changes. Um, and in the workplaces, so all, all your reps and officers will be working on the ground to um, improve, improve, sorry, to improve terms and conditions for members. So we don't just have to rely on the government to give us rights. Unions are winning those in the workplaces every day. Um, but then I think it's important to be realistic about the challenges that unions face. Um, it's increasingly, it's becoming more difficult to organise um, and represent workers, particularly where they're in precarious employment. Um, and largely because of anti-trade union laws, it's difficult to um, sort of take industrial action, and really show some workers for the benefits of being in a union. So I think there are two key factors about the sort of work we'll get in the future. Um, and then I think there are key battlegrounds which um, unions are going to have to fight for um, over the next decade or you know, decades. So I think the first is around artificial intelligence and digitalization and how that's used by employers in the workplace. Second is about the growth of insecure work and how we tackle that. Um, the third area is around how we stop the government, government from deregulating employment law and taking away our employment rights. Um, the fourth area is how we fight off attempts to weaken trade unions and how we get stronger trade unions. Um, and then the fifth area is around the climate emergency um, and how we make sure that jobs are created, uh, good jobs, and we don't end up losing a load of skilled employment and not finding um, alternative employment for those workers. <clears throat> so on, on the first area, um, artificial intelligence and digitalization, um, why we're concerned that this is a problem is that there are a lot of new technologies that um, are used to harvest workforce data. Um, like, so particularly with the pandemic, what we've seen is a, a lot more surveillance tools being installed on people's, people's computers at home. Um, so for example, um, employers can monitor your keystrokes, they can monitor the images that you're looking at on the computer, 
and they can take snapshots of your face and video recordings to see um, um, what sort of uh, mood you're in when you're at work. Um, and then they can collect that data and use it to make unfair, unsafe and discriminatory decisions potentially. So they might say, well, you were away from your desk for 20 minutes, we've got a video recording, we're going to discipline you. That's, that's an example. Um, so I think the question is, are we gonna have te new technologies introduced that will help teachers or make their lives a misery? So I've just given a couple of examples, but I'm not sure these are realistic or not, but it'd be interesting to hear your views. So could we see sort of facial recognition technologies that are installed um, in classrooms that assess uh, teaching style and effectiveness? And then you, th those recordings are sort of used against teachers or on a more positive note, could we see software that would be used to sort of assist teachers in their day-to-day -day jobs and perhaps help with marking or something like that? Um, and I think the key thing there is around the union involvement in data policies. So if a, if a policy is negotiated with the union, then it's more likely to benefit workers than punish them. And I think um, NASUWT has got a good track record there. Um, so I've speaking to officials before about how they've got policies that regulate the use of um, video recording software in lessons. Um, the second area is around insecure work and how we tackle that. So insecure work is on the rise. There's, there's more agency workers. Um, we're seeing um, the use of umbrella companies used a lot now. So an umbrella company is like a, a, payment, a payroll company which is used by an agency or an employer to actually pay the worker. Um, and unfortunately, what we're seeing there is the umbrella is just creaming off some of the money that should go to the worker. So it's another device to take money away from workers. Um, we're seeing more zero hours contracts and more gig work. Um, and looking at um, what NAS UWT have reported about being in the education sector, we're seeing more agency supply staff, um, Education is one of the sectors with the fastest growth in insecure work, having risen by 42% since 2011. And there's, you're seeing the increase of the use of um, exploitative umbrella companies. Um, but on a positive note, um, you've got union campaigns which are trying to improve the conditions for agency supply staff, and you've got solutions like using the teacher supply registry uh, and campaigning to ban agency funder fees. So there are union campaigns which are in place to tackle the problems with insecure work. Um, and there's a large sort of nationwide joint union campaign um, to try and ban umbrella companies. So the third area is how do we stop the government from deregulating employment rights, take, just taking them away from us. Um, unfortunately, recently the government published a, a document around, I think they called it better regulation, when in fact what they were saying is we want to deregulate um, a, a whole raft of employment rights. And particularly after Brexit, um, where the some of our protection, some of our employment rights are no longer protected through EU law, um, they want to remove those. Um, but then I think on the flip side, uh, unions are campaigning for an employment bill, which was promised. Um, we've been waiting for that for a long time. Um, and we've got answers and solutions to how to improve employment rights. So just a couple of examples, we want to see um, greater flexible working rights. So, um, which would make it easier for people to uh, uh, manage their social life and family life. Um, and we also want to see zero hours contracts banned. Um, another concerning area, which we'll have to fight in the future, are further attempts to weaken trade unions. Um, so I think 2016, we saw the Trade Union Act passed, which was made it much harder for unions to take industrial action. Um, and now there are new laws being introduced later in the year, which could see unions um, have to pay substantial amounts of money um, to uh, cover the costs of the certification officer, which is the regulatory body for unions. So that's going to hit unions hard as well, um, because that's money which should be used to support workers and help and organising. Um, but then on the, on the flip side, again, unions are pushing for reforms and we've got ideas about how to um, how unions can play a role in society and, and raise level and help with this leveling up agenda, for example, by improving pay. So we want to see uh, new sector level negotiating forums. Um, so that would be where unions in a particular sector come together with a group of employers in that sector um, and negotiate to set minimum standards. Um, 
And I think it'd be interesting to hear your views on this, but I think you've got something in the education sector, is it the school teachers review body, which makes recommendations about pay. I'm sure there's sort of areas you'd like to see that improve. I think it's the, the, the union said before that it's not truly independent, for example. Um, and we also want to see reforms to um, e-balloting, so make it easier for members to use um, digital ways of getting um, involved in the democratic process of unions. Um, and encouragingly, uh, unions are taking strategic legal cases. Um, there was a big case recently called Costa, which went all the way to the Supreme Court, um, and Unite the Union took the case there, and they were able to um, make sure that their collective bargaining agreements were respected, where the employer basically tried to ignore them um, and go around these agreements to make um, payments directly to members. So unions are fighting back on that. Um, and then finally, I think the climate emergency, um, how we approach that will have a massive impact on the number of jobs um, and the quality of work. Um, so I think TEC research has showed that um, if we don't invest properly um, in new green jobs, new green good quality jobs, um, up to 660,000 manufacturing and supply chain, supply chain jobs could be at risk. But again, I think more positively on the flip side is if we can uh, encourage the government and lobby um, and make sure they do invest, then that could create up to 1.24 million jobs in the following two years. So I think there is hope there um, around that area for the future of work. Um, so that, yeah, that they were the sort of key areas I wanted to flag up on what the, what the TUC is thinking about the future of work and what our priorities will be. That's great, Matt. Thank you very much for that. And um, we do have some questions coming in. And just a reminder uh, for people, if you do want to put your questions um, to either Matt or Jeevan, can you please put them in the, the question, the Q&A box, and we'll come to them um, once we've spoken to Jeevan. But you make some interesting points there, Matt. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'd like to welcome now Jeevan Sander. Jeevan is an economist researching inequality and poverty at King's College London. Um, his research focuses on the political and economic causes of inequality and poverty, as well as their impact on well-being. Uh, prior to King's, he worked as an economist in Somaliland at the Treasury. He's a proud UCU trade union rep, speaking of industrial action, um, and he's currently coordinating their strike. So it's lovely to see you, Jeevan. Um, over to you. You're muted, Jamie. I'm, sorry, I am muted. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> uh, this this Zoom life, hey guys. Uh, it's only, well, firstly, it's only that... been two years. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, guys, look, thanks a lot for having me. It's great to be here, or at least kind of digitally here at the very least. So thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction. And so, really, you know, today I want to cover like three things, right, around the future of work. And the first of which is kind of how technology has changed jobs, and also specifically thinking about teachers, the second of which is how technology has changed the bargaining power of labour and trade union organisation. And finally, thirdly, what skills will children need in a labour market that's been transformed by technology? You know, so to kick it off in terms of how technology has changed jobs in general. So Time magazine ran an article saying that what worries job experts is how automation may prevent the economy from creating enough new jobs. That article was written in 1961. So no, the robots haven't taken your jobs. They probably aren't going to do so in the future either. What technology has done is it's made us all productive or rather more productive overall. It's led to higher employment rates. Before this pandemic, we were at record highs almost. But that doesn't mean it's made us or made everyone has benefited from technological change. See, what technology or rather robots and automation could do is they can undertake routine or programmable tasks far more effectively than humans can do. You know, think about an Excel spreadsheet or, you know, making things on a manufacturing mass production line. Robots are better, that's better at those tasks than we are. So jobs that contained a lot of those routine or programmable tasks were taken by machines. And in particular, the manufacturing sector was destroyed by technology and trade. In 1980, one in five jobs were a manufacturing job. Today, it's less than 7%. But what machines can't do and robots can't do is creative thinking, social interaction and varied physical movements. Now, broadly speaking, non-graduates end up doing jobs that varied physical movements that contain those varied physical movements 
that machines can't really do. Think about barkeeping and hairdressing. Machines don't really alter those jobs. They haven't done so really for the past century. I mean, there's a little bit here and there. You have a nicer till, for example, but fundamentally making a drink is still making a drink. What technology has done is it's changed the types of jobs that graduates do. It's changed the ways in which graduates work. And graduates end up doing jobs that require creative thinking and social interaction. Now, computer and technological change has made those graduates more productive. They make it easier for us to calculate and design and communicate with one another. You know, as teachers, you have Excel, you have email and smart boards, et cetera, that allows you to work more effectively. You're able to think creatively and get machines to do the boring stuff, like handing the marks to the central office. One thing that struck me when I taught in disadvantaged schools during the pandemic as a brilliant club scholar was how much the workplace and teaching had changed as I was a student, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. So like robots aren't really replacing you as teachers. You could communicate with your students, you can understand them in a way that a machine never could. You are becoming more productive because of technology. The question then is how are your wages doing given the fact that you are fundamentally better at your jobs? And now as teachers, you'd expect your wages would keep up with other graduates. It would grow in the same way that other people's wages are. But that clearly hasn't happened. Between 2007 and today, real pay for teachers declined by about 7% while pay in the rest of the economy made broadly stable. So let's move on then to talk about how it is we get you guys some more money. In particular, I want to talk about how technology affects the bargaining power of workers and trade union organisation. You see, what technology kind of allows us to do is it allows us to communicate more easily and it makes us be able to kind of keep up with each other as well. But that cuts two ways. On the first hand, it means you could communicate with your colleagues more easily. But on the second point, it kind of means management can communicate with you. And as has already like previously been covered, monitor you a lot more easily. And the trade-off of those two forces is really what's determining bargaining power in the modern workplace. And who wins will depend upon trade union organization. You know, you think about the Amazon warehouse worker, right? You know, being controlled through an app, but a manager is telling them what to do. They find it hard to build relationships with coworkers. They're not often in the same room. They're not interacting in the same particular way. On the flip side of that is technology makes it easy to communicate with one another once relationships are made, once the organization has started. You know, so for myself, organizing these strikes at, at King's, it was far easier using email and modern technology than it would have been without it. But what was harder was building those relationships in the first place because academics aren't always in the office. They don't work together on broad teams either. It took a lot of kind of patient relationship building before you get to that final stage. And so really the outcome of that trade-off between communication with each other and management communicating with you is what determines the bargaining power for labor. And I'm hearing of lots of really great innovation in the trade union sector organizing through apps, etc., which is making it easier for trade unions to organize and for workers to organize as well. It's heartwarming to see and I look forward to seeing more of that in the future. And finally, I want to move on to what kind of skills that children will need today in a world that's being changed by technology. You know, technological change and, and trade as well have really destroyed those mid-paid manufacturing jobs. And now you have this divided labor market with kind of high and low paid jobs. And not having a high paid job now is really costly, okay? Wages of the top 10% grew about twice as fast as those of the bottom 10% over the past 40 years. You need a high paid job increasingly to have a decent standard of life. And really, those high paid jobs that require analytical interactive tasks, they require people to think creatively and to work with others. And for students, the question then is rather for children, how do we ensure they can work creatively and in teams? And that isn't just about good grades. Now, I'm going to like shamelessly plug my research now. But the moment what I'm looking at is the ways in which childhood and adolescent skills impact the kind of jobs and job tasks you do as adult, and particularly around those high pay analytical and interactive tasks. And what I find is like, yes, like maths and reading and IQs and exams, those things all matter. and They matter a lot. But also... We also have other skills like perseverance and social skills. In particular, emotional health also matters for what kind of jobs you're going to do when you're older. Are you going to have a high paid job and are you going to be employed in the first place? And what I want to focus on here and say specifically 
is emotional health because it's important in the ways that I don't think we really appreciate. What I found at the moment is that emotional health in children as young as seven affects how many high pay analytical interactive tasks they do as adults 20 and 30 years later. And really there are two reasons for that, okay? Firstly, emotional health in childhood is important for later emotional health. If kids are unhappy or depressed, it makes them harder to be happy and be sociable when they grow up. It's harder for them to be in those offices when they have to work well in teams with other people. Think about those kind of, you know, teams of engineers nowadays. Yes, they're working better because of computers, but they're not working alone. They're working with a team of other engineers. The same thing is true for consultants and graduate jobs across the economy. The second reason is that emotional health in childhood impacts how well children learn, how well they learn at later ages. It affects their thinking abilities later on. Now, in short, happy kids learn more and kids who learn more end up earning more. So to conclude and then to sum up really, it's kind of three things I want you to take away from this. Firstly, technology isn't gonna to take to your jobs. It probably won't lead to mass unemployment either. What it's actually doing is making you as teachers a lot more productive. But how your productivity translates to wage gains depends on how well you organize. A technology that makes it easy for you to communicate with others also makes it easier for management to speak to you as well. And who wins that battle is really up to you. And finally, for the children you teach to get those high paid jobs in the future, those require creative thinking and social interaction. They need to do well in the classroom, but they also need to be happy as well. And that's me done. Thank you very much. Lovely, Jaden. Thank you very much. In fact, I'm, I'm going to pose from, from what you were just saying that I'm, I'm going to pose the first question to you. Um, as schools invest in technology, um, is there a risk? of the investment in the teaching profession in terms of training and pay being cut? Um, so the short answer is, you know, kind of putting on my treasury hat here. In one sense, yes, so there's like a fixed pot that you think about, right? There's a fixed pot that will either go to kind of teacher wages or go into these capital investments. There is going to be a trade-off in terms of what goes inside the education sector. The flip side of it is it, it also makes you better as teachers as well. So for a given sum of money, you would expect that actually there is going to be a trade-off kind of being made within the treasury of how they're going to divvy that up. I suppose for teachers, though, the thing to really fight for is to kind of fight for both, basically. You want a world in which your job is easier, but you also want to have good pay on the other side. And I suppose as well, if you as teachers are far more productive and effective, it's much easier to kind of go back to the government and say, look at this great job that we're doing more broadly as well to say actually this is very much kind of future tax revenues are kind of being created in the classroom so absolutely um guys need to pay us some decent wages and attract and kind of retain the kind of talent we know that we see um across the teaching sector thank you thank you Jeevan. Um, matt a question came in for you you were talking about um the technologies where they can kind of record you from home where your employees can see what you're doing and record how long you've been away from your desk or that, that sort of thing. So the question is, how do we protect privacy and work-life balance in a technical technological age? Um, I think that the key thing that we want to see is a, um, a change to the GDPR protections, the general data protection regulations. Um, and what we'd like to see is um, a legal duty to consult with trade unions before any sort of data policies um, are being introduced. So say, for example, that a school wanted to introduce um, a video recording in a lesson or, um, I don't know, some sort of, a, a big thing we're seeing at the moment across all sectors is ratings. So where customers or clients or customers will submit an online rating um, and then that data is fed into an algorithm um, and then that's used to decide um, the pay levels and whether someone's given work. So I'm not saying this will happen in the education sector, but like worst case scenario, you start seeing ratings introduced where students and, um, are rating their teachers and then that's used to determine um, the pay levels or whether somebody's disciplined or something like that. So before those like ho horrific um, performance management systems are introduced, what we'd like to see is a legal duty that an employer has to consult with the union about how those technologies are introduced and when they're introduced. Um, yeah, so I think that's the key 
key protection we need really. Mm. Things like this have been in, happening for quite a while in education, you know, a few years back when when um, schools were trying to put cameras in rooms so they could all be monitored all the time. And I think it's an extension, obviously, from that, but that raised its own difficulties for us at the time. And it is something that, you know, we're still constantly having to battle. And with the new technologies, as, as you're speaking about now, then that's something that we're going to have to continue, obviously, that, that fight as well. Um, another question, I'm, I'm not sure who, which of you want to take this, but um, let, let's see. Employers use the term flexible working when they actually mean insecure. How can we make sure teachers are treated the way that workers in the gig economy are? Jeevan, maybe. Um, yeah, sure. It's certainly something we see in the university sector as well. It's actually really, um, or as we've seen the latest strike action, really, really bad. We, we know there's at least, I think, 70,000 on short-term contracts, like another 50,000 when you add in everyone, over 100,000. Most of the teaching staff are on these contracts that people call flexible, but actually means no security, right? And you need to know if you have a job and if you have a desirable or other steady paycheck to settle down, pay the bills, have kids, etc. cetera. Right? We're really kind of seeing this um, problem all the way forward. I think one of the issues at the moment is, and no doubt, you know, Matt will be able to speak to this a lot more than I can, but in one sense, um, management more broadly or employers more broadly have been kind of on the cutting edge of this technology and have moved a lot faster and obviously don't have to worry about, in some sense, consulting that much. So it's much easier for them to say, okay, I am going to hire this person on a short-term contract. Um, it's easier for me to arrange that and easier for them to kind of have to move on without them being able to really do anything because there's lots of teachers, lots of people, and these contracts are being made kind of all over the economy at the same time. It's a huge problem that we see I think the real thing there for the other side is actually for trade union organization to kind of step up and say, these aren't the kind of contracts that most people want. Like there are some, as you guys will know, supply teachers and flexible working that people will like to have. But on the other side of it, it's you have this contract which only gives you a couple of days a week for like a very short period of time. It helps kind of um, a school kind of assign resources incredibly kind of efficiently in the sense of, I only need someone for so many hours. This person's only here for so many hours. You do cut kind of labor costs, but obviously it means that those in labor aren't living decent lives or able to do so. And so really, yes, this is the kind of push that we're definitely seeing. Um, as with the other side of it is absolutely, it's for trade unions to organize effectively. And there are ways that we have seen to organize effectively and kind of push back against that. But it really is about uh, building that bargaining power of labor and ensuring that it's not becoming a, a norm or kind of creeping through. Thank, thanks, Jeevan. Uh, Matt, is there anything that you want to add to that, maybe? Um, I think the best way to try and stop insecure work is to um, for unions to negotiate collective agreements to um, protect the sort of agency workers where they're being used. So I think that, like, as continue to do what NASUWT is doing, really, in protecting... Um, supply teachers. So, for an example is you might include in that collective agreement um, a term which says that uh, supply teachers would, could can transition to permanent posts after a um, fixed amount of time. So, like uh, practical safeguards which unions can negotiate, which um, keep people out of um, agency work. I think the, the other thing they might be able to do, unions generally, I mean, is sort of highlight the the waste of money that. Um, insecure work is so particularly in the education sector um, I know for example that some of the agencies are charging 40% um, markup fees so that's money which is being taken from the education sector um, and just given to private recruitment agencies um, and they're also trying to charge like 5, 5k 10k finder fees um, when a teacher goes into a permanent position from supply things so I think it's about unions keeping an eye on that and trying to stamp out those practices and I think um, what we're trying to do is with flexible working as well is look at it on the flip side. So although employers have like, put this term flexible working where they mean insecure employment, we're trying to make the argument for flexible working for, for workers as well, um, particularly with all the stuff which is happening around hybrid working. And we don't want to see that go back to like, um, practice as usual where people have to go to the office. We want to see greater flexibility. 
Um, and I know that the teaching unions have had real trouble with um, right to request flexibly being turned down. Um, that's a real problem in the education sector. So we um, well, I'm just interested to hear what you what you think about how how you'd like to see flexible working for teachers and how that might work as well. Yeah, yeah, it 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 it, it is difficult. You know, everybody has the right to make that request, don't they? Um, but I don't know what it's like in other professions. But in teaching, there is still a. a a big hurdle to get over with employers about the fact that teachers can be as productive if they're working flexibly or if they're, you know, job sharing, that sort of thing. And that for, for some employers, that is difficult for them, I think, to get their heads around, um, unfortunately. Um, right, another question's come in. This one's to you, Jeevan. If happy students mean greater future happiness and higher wages, should the profession be more concerned at the high stakes, high accountability regime we currently have impacting negatively on student mental health? Um, the short answer is, I suspect so, yes. Like if you're having to, um, especially I know in the teaching profession, you have such high increasing workloads, such huge amounts to do actually caring for the wealth of your students becomes increasingly difficult if you're working 50, 60 hour weeks, right? And that cuts, not just in the sense of you've got more students and more things to do, but on the flip side of that is if you're working that hard, it's hard to have, if you like, the, the psychological resources even to invest in those children. You know, the flip side of it is, you know, for parents as well, you know, parents who are well off kind of tend to be able to invest more in their kids but that's not just about money it's about the fact that because they're less stressed about paying the bills they're also able to kind of you know spend time and like you know do the right kind of play and read every single night all those kind of activities etc for teachers it's, it's definitely an issue and the other problem is as well is as we tend to find generally speaking what you're targeting you can address that but then you end up missing things that aren't being targeted right if the target is around improving certain grades and certain outcomes and getting certain marks on those key stages for example or certain improvements what you're missing out on the other side is all the stuff that you know teachers used to be able to do because they had the space to do it and weren't stuck inside this particular regime so absolutely it's a problem it would be great to see kind of a push for that particular side of things now obviously it's quite hard to measure that right how well you're doing those things but it does it does really make a difference it'd be great to kind of see that push happen um i hope that we do is the long and the short of it but the worry is i suppose the pushback is to say if you're measuring and meeting these particular targets you're also missing the things that also matter and particularly around engagement with children i appreciate that as teachers by the way like you do this great job and actually a lot of what these children could do does depend fundamentally on their home life as well and you don't really have a lot of control over that and you can't be expected to either of course but anything can be done in schools it would be great to see in particular to see teachers have kind of the space that they need to be able to do that in particular yeah and i think especially for, because of the struggles of the pandemic and we've seen obviously a lot of online learning um mm. the impact that that has had on pupils not just the teachers, but the impact that, that that has had on pupils and their mental health has been quite quite dramatic, I think, in, in some cases. Um, Matt, here's one for you, I think. Do we need to be thinking of the impact on teachers with protected characteristics under equality legislation to make sure that they aren't disadvantaged by new technologies? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, so I think that some of these new technologies have um, proven to be um, discriminatory. I'm just trying to think of some which have been introduced recently. There's a, a, a case, I think, with um, uh, Uber, the, the drivers, um, and they were using... Um, so I think what happened is the driver had to uh, log on at the beginning of the day with a snapshot of their face. Um, and I think the, the black drivers were saying that the software wasn't recognising their faces or wasn't matching them up to assignment. So the, the union took them to um, court and it was found that the software was flawed um, and was sort of inadvertently um, punishing the black drivers. Um, and there's been similar examples as well where you have like automatic um, 
uh, CV scraping tool. So when you apply for a job, um, this, your CV would be put through this um, automatic CV scanner and pick out keywords. Um, but what they found is that the, it was all male engineers who programmed the um, CV scanner. So they were looking for terms which male engineers often use. Um, so they were like widely excluding um, a whole range of female engineers who weren't using that type of um, terminology which the male engineers have used. So yeah, I think we, we need to worry that where algorithms and technologies are used, that they might be, um, like in some cases unintentionally, but other times they, that they're being used to discriminate against workers. So it, it is worrying, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. I can see you nodding as well there, Jeevan. Is there anything that you want to add to that? Uh, it's incredibly, got... no, just that it is incredibly worrying. And also it is uh, like that, it's very inadvertent, right? But it is something happening. And I know particularly as well, uh, women did being disadvantaged you know here we talk about cvs but in a whole range of particular technological applications broadly speaking um designed by men and not you know not that they're intentionally sexist but they kind of have a certain view of the world and without enough diversity in that in that room and that design process it's actually really costing um women in particular kind of a huge range of different applications um as well as kind of things the way that things are designed as well and it's really quite um so we have to look look out for basically is what I would say. Yeah, yeah, very much. Okay, um, I don't know who wants to pick this one up, but let's see. As work in the education sector evolves and changes, how can we make sure that sustainability and environmental factors are properly considered? Matt, do you want to go first, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> Matt. I think Jeevan's just thrown you under the bus there. No, yeah. sorry, Rob. <laughs> if, you, if you've got something that immediately springs to mind, Jeevan, do you want to go first? Because I'm a bit outside I, the sort of knowledge. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I suppose in one sense, I don't want to push too much onto teachers to ask them to solve the climate change, at climate crisis, as well as kind of, you know, raise young children uh, or rather teach them. I suppose that one thing that would be... Um, nice to see is I suppose actually kind of two things actually the first of which is around trying to just teaching children in general being pushed for them to kind of be educated in this particular manner it's been great to see kind of school strikes across the world being a huge kind of uh, lever to push kind of you know people of older generations that by the way this is the planet that we need to have um, and for those children to push for that is a very powerful message that actually we care about our futures and you guys need to pick it up and I suppose the second is in ways in which kind of all of us individuals can push our kind of workplaces, et cetera, to be more sustainable and environmentally friendly, whatever that will end up meaning. And I'm hoping that the schools in particular will mean things like insulation, for example, and heat pumps. So the next 10 years about climate change is really about reducing a lot of fossil fuel emissions from buildings will be the next big challenge, the next big um, thing we have to do. And so it'd be great to kind of see that push come out. So from students and kind of, kind of teaching students and pushing kind of uh, the education sets to be a lot more kind of net zero with with fewer emissions. I know Insulate Britain are uh, can be incredibly annoying by blocking up roads, uh, but the fundamental point about insulation, home insulation is really key to get to net zero is correct. Like it absolutely is something we have to do uh, very, very fast. Thanks, Jude. And Matt? Yeah, I suppose just a couple of um, quick points. Um, you, I think union involvement is key. Um, so involve, uh, bringing, bringing the issue to your rep or your union officer um, and making sure that it's put on the bargaining agenda so that they can speak to um, school leaders about it and try and bring about those changes through negotiation. Um, and I think the other key concern is um, perhaps union reps and officers who, who know the staff, know the types of jobs in the education sector, could work to identify where jobs might be at risk through um, uh, where change, changes are coming to jobs because of like uh, green upskilling and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. um, and identifying those jobs and making sure that those people aren't sort of made redundant and on the scrap heap, um, but they're offered chances to reskill, um, retrain, and get new jobs um, in, in, when. When these changes happen. Yeah. 
Yeah, th thanks very much, both of you, for that one. Um, I think you'll. I think this one will be a little bit more easy to to answer straight off the bat. Historically, large workplaces with lots of workers on site have been easier for trade unions to organise. How should unions respond to increased hybrid and flexible working in respect of organising and recruiting? Jeevan, do you want to I go first? Yeah, I'm happy to, to go first. No doubt um, Matt will have lots of uh, kind of great insider mm. as well, kind of practical knowledge of how these things work. In general, like it is, it is the trade-off from earlier, right? It is the thing of, you know, one of the reasons why we see such huge trade union declines since the 1980s is precisely because you used to have this manufacturing mass production line where kind of, um, kind of mid pay and high pay workers are working all together in this huge workplace they saw their interests as being combined. They worked together to negotiate with management. It was easier to kind of build that relationship and make that kind of trade union movement very strong. One of the things that technological change has done is it's not just changed the type of jobs we work, but also how work is organized more broadly. You don't have that manufacturing mass production line anymore. You've also seen um, a divide in workplaces. So it's not just that, you have these high and low pay jobs. You also have high and low pay workplaces, right? You have like Ernst & Young or PwC as this massive high pay consultancy. And also the cleaners who work there won't work for Ernst & Young. They'll work for another firm in particular, okay? So it's much more difficult. You have this kind of fragmentation both within workplaces and also now between them as well. So it is fundamentally a, a much bigger challenge. In terms of how to do it and how to organize effectively, and the first is just like building relationships, which is kind of a lot harder obviously during the pandemic, but hopefully we get back and forward. It is about building that relationship on the off and actually, you know, it sounds somewhat trite, but actually just like speaking and talking to people and like making kind of the hard work of like going out there and, you know, explaining what's going on. Um, ask them how the kids are before you start chatting about the union. Do you know what I mean? Like it's stuff like that to build that relationship in the first place and then to move on to kind of what the technological solutions are. Because of course, you know, if management communicate well, can kind of um, control you a lot more easily, it also means you can communicate with others. But we are also bombarded every single day with, you know, dozens of WhatsApp messages, emails, etc. Uh, and I'm speaking as an academic at a university. I don't have to deal with 30 students plus their parents plus everyone else that you people, you, know, you uh, teachers must have to deal with. I can't imagine the amount of you know stuff. It's just another email from someone else from a union. It's going to be like, yeah, okay, fine, but you know, I've also got like to deal with the kids, and ASOS has a sale on, and apparently all these other people do, and life is just you know coming at me constantly. Um, so I think it's that like don't underestimate the the power of human relationships they still matter um the metaverse is terrifying for lots of reasons but also because it's sadly kind of redundant view of humanity like sitting around and chatting to other people is quite nice um so like i think that's the first thing and then like absolutely exploit technology because it can make once you get past that first hurdle um much easier to kind of sort things out it is much easier to fundamentally whatsapp someone i know than have to find them in an office 30 or 40 years ago when there was an email and I didn't know where they would be necessarily any given day. Yeah, thank, thanks, Stephen. Matt? Uh, yeah, I think um, unions are doing some practical things um, to try and like, engage with hard to reach workers. So perhaps people who aren't on the same site as them or people who are in um, agency work and like flitting in and out of assignments and not, not at the workplace very often. So I think one thing we've seen uh, quite a lot recently is um, collective agreements being signed with like the tier one contractor. So the organization right at the top who would commission um, the use of agencies um, or the use of um, like extending the supply chains. So say for example, on a big like construction project, um, the, the union would sign an agreement with the construction company um, and, the, the, and the people who, who are having the work done <clears throat> basically saying the union's going to have access to workers throughout all the sites. You're going to give us a list of um, who the people are um, and we'll have a, a 20 minute slot to speak to all of them. So I think that's a practical thing you can do like, by signing an agreement to start off with. Um, 
But then I think that Jeevan's actually spot on about saying that it's um, the most important thing still is just trying to get out to actually speak to people. Um, a lot of unions are saying, well, it's, it's, it's all very well doing the WhatsApp and um, virtual meetings and team meetings, but nothing's more effective than actually just going out and um, speaking to workers. Um, and, and we're still told from unions that, like, that the most common reason for people not jo joining the union is, well, no one's asked me. Um, so and I'm sure that's common across all different sectors. And that's not criticism of unions or reps at all, because it's quite difficult when you're doing your job and you're doing another job for the union as well to get out and speak to everyone. But I still think that's the most effective way of getting people to join a union and become active is by just going and speaking to them. Like Jeevan was saying, just having a chat, telling them about the benefits of the union. Um, but then I suppose on the flip side, just really quickly, like um, with the gig economy, we have seen a lot of um, online organising and just how effective that is. So like through the use of petitions to engage workers um, and WhatsApp. So I know with like, some of the big courier companies, they've got these massive um, WhatsApp lists. Anyone who joins gets put onto the WhatsApp list. And, and that's quite a quick and easy way to coordinate action. Um, like we're, all the taxi drivers will meet at this point at this time. We're all going to take this action on this day. And that's a good way of um, communicating with people. And those are the messages that we give out to our, our workplace representatives as well. You know, have that conversation. You're the first person that people walking, new staff walking in through the door are going to see, you know, build that relationship. I think the struggle in some schools, um, especially nowadays, is the fact that when where there used to be staff rooms and people could go and they could meet together, um, obviously we've got the restrictions of the pandemic, but more so than that, in the new schools that have been built, there aren't staff rooms, you know, and, and it's stopping those people having those conversations, which are absolutely vital for any trade union when it comes to organising and recruiting, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, Claire, um, can, I, can I ask one thing? Very of course, quickly? yeah. Yeah, I just Matt made the point about uh, never underestimate the power of a WhatsApp group. So like last year at, at King's, uh, they were going to cut, low paid teaching staff salaries by a third basically uh, they put out a contract that decided to like uh, well put out a rather an advertisement that decided to unilaterally change it and because we had a whatsapp group for all of these people which was actually completely unrelated it was just kind of like hey you've joined like most of it was like you know we're going to the pub on this day or like what's going on with this form or whatever it was but when it came to that particular pay cut it was very easy to very quickly be like this isn't okay and because you communicate with everyone at the same time all of a sudden it was very easy to kind of you know build that collective action very fast and like we got to a point where like they reversed a few weeks later basically but without that whatsapp group uh, it would have been a lot more difficult and it has just made that particular um, aspect of it much much easier yeah, and I'll, I'll echo that. Um, we see it in schools where we've got potential disputes coming up or, you know, something is being brought in and the, it's so easy for them to be able to organise amongst themselves. And it's that strength, isn't it, when, when you've got people all use, using the same voice, I suppose, to, to get their message across. But, yeah, it's com vitally important. I completely agree. Um, okay. We've got another question here. I'm just looking at the time. Um, looking at other countries, what lessons can we learn? You know, are there any examples of good and bad practice from elsewhere that maybe we could learn from? Either of you. Stephen? Um, off the off the top of my head, I mean, there have been some some great movements. I know Walmart had one in particular. Um, in Germany, it's somewhat easier because their workplace are organised somewhat more or differently. They have this much larger manufacturing sector in general. I suppose one thing I would say is that if even in a country like the United States, we're seeing victories for trade unions organising in some of the ways we're talking about today, which is using technology to kind of build up momentum it can definitely be done and also taking on uh, huge organizations like walmart of course um, there is definitely a way to do it 
the flip side of that is also you look at United States and some of the the tactics that employers use there to kind of stop unionization and make it try to there's a messaging there that goes you know trade unions will destroy this workplace you don't want to join it it's going to make it uh, really really awful I know we've seen that um, time and time again I know very recently Amazon I think just lost the unionization ballot and so those two things are really things to learn from like yes you can if you kind of master effectively you can do well but also be aware that on the other side of it um there is a kind of powerful force that's arrayed against you that also knows how to message really well mm. and the final thing i would say particularly around messaging is um make it visceral and real and don't try and make it too abstract which i'm sure um you all do anyway to be fair but one of the problems is particularly of uh, people on quote unquote the left is sometimes to talk about abstract ideals like social justice rather than the amount of money in my pocket when can I see the kids I'm stressed out and actually people respond to money in my pocket can I see the kids not to this abstract ideals of kind of um, fairness and justice which are of course incredibly important but also don't tug at the emotional heartstrings and the for what about the right and in particular those organizations know how to kind of message incredibly well mm. Thanks. Matt? Um, <clears throat> I think just looking at Amazon, for example, it's been incredibly difficult for unions across the globe to get Amazon to the negotiating table and, um, and force through uh, union recognition. But I think um, there has been, I think in Germany, they've had a bit more success. Um, and I think there's a simple lesson there. They've got much better and stronger labour laws, which will require the employer to sit down with the union um, and talk about key terms and conditions um, and if they don't they, the Amazon in Germany would face um, sort of like severe sanctions so I think the lesson there is from other countries is we need much stronger labour laws that make it easier for unions to get recognised and have access to workplaces um, and create that legal duty where employers have to speak to unions um, and then I suppose the other area where we look which we're looking at, at the moment is around um, sort of family friendly parental rights um, and I think there's a lot we can learn from other countries there because we have a, a paltry amount of um, uh, paternity leave for um, parents over here. It's like two weeks paid at, uh, what is it, 96 quid a week, which is absolutely terrible, which means a lot of um, new fathers, for example, will miss out on, on supporting the mother just after she's given birth because they can't afford to do so. Um, but what we could learn a lot from other countries there, particularly the sort of Scandinavian countries where each parent is given a, a block of really highly paid leave, uh, which enables them to sort of take a lot of time off and support each other and support the child. Um, so I think that's probably one area where we're, we're doing a bit of research to see what we can learn from other countries. Mm. Lovely, right. OK, last question then. Um, as schools become more reliant on technology, how can we ensure that the digital divide doesn't mean students from less well-off backgrounds are even more disadvantaged? Who'd like to go first with that one? I'm, I'm happy to. Um, it, it's hard, it's the long or the short of it, because, you know, the most... You see a similar thing also with the social security system, the DWP, like those who are the most deprived, also those who are locked out of technology. And as these are constantly moved online, it becomes difficult for children to, to have access. So when I was uh, teaching in, in kind of disadvantaged schools during the pandemic, it was very much like things had to be online, but we kind of were in and out because of, you know, COVID, et cetera. At the end in particular, it was like so-and-so may or may not have a computer or they're sharing an iPad with their sister or their brother um get it sometimes it's it's all very very difficult on top of the fact that you're sat in a room with a screen it's all it's all very hard um i suppose in one sense don't put too much pressure on yourselves as teachers like you're not there and it's impossible for you to fix all these problems right i suppose the thing to do is really to push for there to be universal access to certain things in particular if possible and if not any kind of provision you can do and really kind of make the case of we need to have computers or something else and if children now in a world where they may need laptops to learn full stop then actually get those laptops provided and um, really make that push in the schools and at unions um i suppose the, the fundamental answer is push for it hard children are going to need technology so make sure they can actually know how to use it 
is incredibly important um and really make that case but also don't give yourselves too much grief if like it doesn't always happen out because you know it it can't be the case that teachers are both having to address um you know teaching schools the classroom but also make sure they have an ipad at home or a, or a laptop like it's it's a lot to kind of put on yourselves you know yeah and i think before they even get to the laptops it's do they have internet at home you know do they have that access to that full stop um very difficult matt please um i, I don't really know the answer to that one um but i suppose just to ask you what the union's position on that is us the thing that sprang to my mind i'm not even sure this is correct is about the pupil premium and how that's distributed and should we be looking at some sort of um financial support which goes directly to that to that family to make sure they can access the, the broadband and, and have the hardware to be able to like log on and access mm. i think the problem that you've got is that since the you know we, we have the funding formula and funding is supposedly distributed to where it is needed most it is pupils in more disadvantaged areas those who are receiving less money mm. um, from the government through the funding formula so I don't know about leveling up but I don't see that happening across many of the disadvantaged areas with pupils who are coming from the most difficult backgrounds especially um, I'm thinking about the area where I am and in particular where I am um, where I'm negotiating secretary for in Blackburn with Darwin a lot of areas around us have, have we suffer from very very disadvantaged um a, num a very high number of disadvantaged pupils and the money that's coming in just isn't enough to help them never mind providing laptops or ipads or dongles or whatever you want, want to be it just doesn't work um but unfortunately i think we are where we are um anyway i'm just looking at the time Thank you very much, um, both both of you, to Jeevan and Matt. Um, I think some of the discussions that we've had coming from the questions especially have been quite thought provoking um, for us as well. And we really do appreciate you spending your time on a Saturday, Matt. I think you can go off and play with your daughter now. Um, and you as well, Jeevan, thank you very much. And good luck with the continued industrial action for UCU. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very um, much. Thanks a lot. No problem. Thank you for being with us. Colleagues, um, it's going to be lunchtime now. If you can return promptly for half past one for the next session, um, we'll see you then. Thank you very much, Jeevan. Thank you, Matt.